Well, uh, welcome everybody. I appreciate everyone joining us tonight, uh, particularly if you've been on before, and as well as if you're joining us for the first time. We are the Knoxville History Project, and our mission is very simple. It's to research and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. We have got 37 of these recorded talks online, thanks to Nicole, 20 from last year, 17 from this year. So this will be 18 uh, in the next few days uh, when Nicole gets it up after tonight's show. And you can find those on our website, knoxvillehistoryproject.org through our portal. And you can find them through the podcast and dialogues uh, section. Also, just two little tiles over there on the downtown art wraps. Um, if you want to learn more about our art wraps program, we have uh, 28 wraps that we've done. Two are actually temporarily offline because of an issue with a couple of traf traffic boxes. Um, but we have 16 and uh, 16 out of the 28 come from the Knoxville Museum of Art. So I really want to thank Stephen and, uh, and Clark and David Butler at KMA for uh, letting me pester you for almost four years, uh, sharing your wonderful gems from the, uh, from the collection at uh, KMA. So thank you, Stephen, for that. Happy to do it. And uh, you can also find a, a map online on the Knoxville History Project uh, Art Wraps page. Um, as you can see, we've got like four on Magnolia up in the uh, kind of the Northeast there, but uh, we keep adding to that. Next one is gonna go up in the next few weeks. It's a Russell Briscoe painting on the corner of uh, Cumberland and Henley Street. Um, his painting of the uh, 18, uh, 19th century um, East Tennessee Willie, uh, Women's Academy. So look out for that one when we share it when we get it up. Uh, also, Talking to thanks, uh, thanks again to council members Lynn Fugate and Charles Thomas for supporting this series as it continues uh, almost a year now. I'm going to turn it over to Jack to introduce uh, Stephen Wicks, our speaker this evening. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Paul, and, and we're uh, we're grateful and uh, and and have a lot of fun combining history with with art and 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 uh, as as many things that it, it, as many places as, as it'll fit. Uh, when I first began writing, uh, writing about local history, uh, I think it was kind of obvious that Knoxville had a deep uh, literary culture and had a deep musical culture, especially in terms of folk or country music. Um, and uh, we, uh, those are the two things that were that were really great about Knoxville. Uh, but we sometimes looked at, uh, enviously at other cities like uh, like Chattanooga that had uh, a well-established art scene, um, and uh, and. And, and and other you know, other places, I thought, well, that that's one place that that I'm not sure we that we could stand to to have some improvement. But I, it just showed how little I knew about uh, uh, local art. Uh, when the KMA opened in 1990, uh, the uh, the assumption was that what they were going to feature was going to be mainly art from around the world, art from other places, uh, not necessarily local art. But as we kind of cobbled things together and started thinking about local artists uh, from from Kevin Wiley to uh, Buford Delaney to uh, all these other people that a lot of people never heard of uh, yeah. that we began to realize there was there is a, a genuine art scene and an art narrative here and it really took the KMA to begin telling this story and uh, and Stephen Wicks who's actually been doing what he does I think slightly longer than I've been doing what I do but uh, it, it's a uh, uh, he's been a, a great uh, a champion of, of of this idea and uh, the and the higher ground exhibit. And I'll let him explain what this all is. It's it is a, a it's a well it's a historical narrative. And I think anybody that's interested in Knoxville history, even if you don't know anything about art, I think would be would find it fascinating to go there and just see how things have evolved here in Knoxville uh, and and in the in the general area. Um, but uh, without further ado, I, I want to yield the yield the floor to to, to uh, Stephen Wicks and 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 tell us. Tell us, uh, uh, it, it kind of, he'll be kind of our uh, our our tour guide, our our hiking guide through uh, through Knoxville Knoxville art uh, tonight, and I'm looking forward to it myself. Stephen, thank you very much, Jack, and thanks also, Paul and Nicole, for the great work you do at the Knoxville History Project. We appreciate uh, all the great stories that you brought out, and you've really inspired us on many occasions. So one of the things that is Jack mentioned, one of the things we tried to do at the KMA is to tell a compelling story when it comes to the development of the arts in East Tennessee. And the story you're gonna to hear tonight is gonna to be very informal. It's gonna be fast paced. So like one of Jack's urban hikes, uh, fasten your seatbelt. 
I'm going to more or less uh, move through higher ground chronologically, and I'm going to touch on key works of art, key artists who I think really are cornerstones in this narrative. And it's uh, something that I need to go back and credit our director, David Butler, for because I had worked for the museum for years back when we were doing blockbusters of art from far and wide. I left the KMA for several years working at another museum. When I came back, David had been hired and he looked at me and said, you know, one of the things I'm really hoping you can do is that you can anchor this museum's identity in home soil. And I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I'm hoping you can come up with a way. And so our conversations led to uh, this narrative that now occupies a permanent uh, gallery on the KMA's third floor. It's one of our largest galleries and it's actually now starting to burst at the seams. Let's see. So I also wanted to thank the Knoxville History Project for celebrating the KMA's collection with these art wraps all over town. I was just mentioning how Knoxville artist Bob Birdwell, who was a member of the Knoxville Seven and loved downtown Knoxville, he would have so been excited to see his own paintings on one of the art wraps on Gay Street. Um, one of the first sections in the exhibition is called Grand Ambitions forging an arts community. And so I wanna look at a painting that we borrowed from the Tennessee State Museum because when Higher Ground first opened in 2008, a lot of the art in that gallery was on loan because the KMA's collection was rather small. And so we were borrowing this landmark landscape painting by James Cameron. Uh, it's a familiar scene for those of you who have been out to Lakeshore Park and looked out toward Bell Isle, which we can see uh, celebrated in the middle of this expanse of, of water. Uh, and this is a painting from 1861. And the Tennessee State Museum was very generous. They allowed us to borrow it for a couple of years, but their curator kept nudging me, you know, we'd really like to have that back at some point. And I had heard that there were several versions of this painting done by Cameron within a fairly short time span. And I was able to find the Knoxville collector who owned one of the paintings. First of all, here's the view as it looks today, more or less. But this is one of the versions of that Cameron painting that was in a private collection in Knoxville. It's a little bit smaller. It looks more like a close-up scene. Uh, the foliage looks midsummer. The problem was the collectors really didn't want to lend. And so I was only able to view it in their home. Then I was able to make contact with another collector from out of town who owned the third version. And I wanted to borrow it, but then when I finally got a chance to meet the collector and view the painting, it had a lot of, of paint loss, a lot of condition problems. And so we thought, well, let's just see if the Tennessee State Museum will let us continue to borrow their painting. So one thing led to another and their curator, Jim Hubler calls me and he says, Stephen, you'll never believe it, but you know, I'd heard rumor that there was a fourth version of the James Cameron Bell Isle from Lion's View. And it just popped up at a New York auction. And the estimate on it is ridiculously low. So I think he was basically trying to get me to buy my own version of this painting so they could have theirs back. Long story short, David Butler and I went back and forth about what our highest bid should be. Uh, we really went to the mat and we were successful in acquiring this largest of the four versions by James Cameron of Belle Isle. It's also one that I think really allows that distant mountain range to shine against that brighter background. And the, the wing dam that you see in a couple of the other versions is there. And it's also the only version that has uh, two people in a boat. So it's got these additional features that the other paintings didn't have. And we're so excited to have this as one of the first works that you see when you walk into the gallery. Um, here, I thought it would be fun to see all four versions on one screen with, again, a photograph of what that view looks like today. Um, 
you know, one of the other side notes about this is that the painting was owned, our painting was owned by Adolf Ox. And Adolf Ox was the publisher of the New York Times at a time when the paper was really floundering. And he came up to New York, became the publisher and really helped get it to a whole new level of success. But before he took over the New York Times, he worked for the Chattanooga Times and also as a young man, as, as a youth for the Knoxville Chronicle. And so my theory about this is that he wanted to acquire this painting because it reminded him of his childhood when he first got started in the newspaper business. And it's great for us to be able to, be able to tell that story as well. So in 2013, we were the successful purchaser and we're so thrilled to have this in the collection. Um, moving on to another part of the first chapter of Higher Ground is none other than Lloyd Branson, uh, one of the most important professional artists in that first chapter in Knoxville's art history. He specialized in uh, portrait paintings, society paintings of prominent individuals, but also of great history paintings and genre paintings such as Holling Marble on the left from 1910, which we're borrowing from the McClung Museum. We've been very grateful. They've been so generous in lending it to us. Uh, we again were faced with how do we acquire great examples of these early artists' works. They're really rare and uncommon. And so uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to be the successful bidders of this painting on the right from 1920 called Going Home at Dusk. And it's an unusual painting for Branson in that it's not terribly specific when it comes to the historical or landscape details. It seems as if his real motive with this composition is more about light and atmosphere, which reminds me of, uh, in terms of composition, Claude Monet's very important groundbreaking uh, impressionist painting from 1972, where you've got this central light source and divided brush strokes. On the right, you see a detailed image of our Branson painting. And you can see how he's using dabs of very bright paint to create this composition in a way that you wouldn't see in his portraits or historical scenes. And I wanted to show this, uh, Buford Delaney's first work of art uh, from 1922, it's a Knoxville landscape. He was actually in Branson's studio working as basically Branson's protege, learning about how an artist would run a studio and uh, establish a studio practice. But I just find a striking parallel between Delaney's first known work of art, this, this gouache and watercolor on paper and Branson's going home at dusk. They're done roughly two years apart. But what I also find interesting is how Branson more likely than not was persuaded to dabble in impressionism by his sidekick, Catherine Wiley. The two of them were linchpins of Knoxville's early art scene. And this is a great example of her impressionist paintings. The KMA has always owned uh, a later work of hers, but we were able to acquire this one at auction, which I think is a fabulous example of her typical view. And that is uh, woman and child uh, out of doors in natural light. And here's a rare scene that shows you on the left, this is the way the painting looked to David Butler and me when we showed up at Case antiques and we're ready to bid on it. But we knew that underneath that superficial layer of soot and grime was a jewel-like painting. And so sure enough, when the conservator in Nashville finished with it, we were just blown away. Um, I wanted to share with you too, one of the things that Branson and Wiley did early on was to help organize major cultural expositions that took place at what's today Chilhowie Park. They were responsible for really helping to organize and coordinate the art pavilion, the fine art pavilion. And what they did was they organized a show of work by artists south of the Ohio River, 
which they included their own examples from here in Knoxville. And then they brought in work from far and wide as a way of really showcasing the fact that they were on par with the best from California, New York, other parts of the country. And I came across a clipping from the Knoxville Journal back in 1913, where a reviewer is looking at basically Wiley, Branson, all of the, the artists south of the Ohio River who had their work on display. And he mentions how Wiley has this group of three paintings, two of which were brand new. And he describes this pleasing picture of a study of a woman and child out of doors. The figures are sitting in sunlight while dark woods form the background. And the painting is strongly handled. So I'd like to believe that this painting, which is also dated 1913, is the painting that this reviewer describes. We'll never know, but I think the odds are, are pretty strong that it is. And then we were really fortunate at the end of 2020, uh, in the midst of the pandemic, we were getting all these really important acquisitions. And one of which was a group of three paintings gifted by the family of Catherine Wiley. They could have gifted them to the museums where they are based in Milwaukee, but they chose the KMA. And this is one of the stellar examples out of those three. And what's great about this painting, Woman with Parasol, is that we have a photograph that shows Wiley painting at her easel out of doors with the model uh, posed in the distance with the sunlight. And it's, it's exciting to have this historical document that shows you how she staged this painting. So we've got not the largest collection of Wiley's paintings, but I think one of the best you'll find anywhere. And the three that we just acquired are on the bottom row and on the right. Now the next section in Higher Ground deals with defining a regional identity. Uh, it looks at mountain vistas and urban life. And one of the anchor views that's been in higher ground off and on for years is this black and white photograph of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park by none other than Ansel Adams who came through here in 1948. And I did some research. First of all, I didn't think we had a prayer at being able to find a vintage or lifetime print by Ansel Adams and be able to afford it. And what I found when I talked to some photography dealers is they told me, you know, he printed on demand. And if you want a Moonrise Hernandez, one of his best known works, there are a number of prints out there on the market of that particular scene. The problem is you can pay as much as six figures to acquire one. And then the funny thing is the scenes of East Tennessee are extraordinarily rare because they weren't in great demand yet we were able to acquire this photograph for a 10th of what most of his California prints would go for. What was interesting was I came across a letter that was in conjunction with this particular visit he made where he writes to this renowned photography curator, Beaumont Newhall. And he writes, Dear Beaumont, this is October 9th, 1948. Your very good letter of September 30th just arrived here in Gatlinburg. The Smokies are okay in their way, but they're going to be devilish hard to photograph. And so I, I've been trying for years to figure out what did he mean by that and why was it gonna be so difficult? My suspicion was that Adams was used to this dry atmosphere with really clean, sharp contours in the landscape, uh, elbow room to get his big eight by 10 camera out there and be able to just get these great sight lines and that in the Smokies, maybe he didn't have that luxury, but I was never really sure about this. And one of the things I started to do was to figure out, well, what else did he print from this visit? It turns out of the 47 images that he actually took, he only printed three, these three. And fortunately, the two on the right that we don't yet own, we've been able to borrow from the Tennessee State Museum. We're waiting for them to come up at a gallery somewhere and we're hoping we'll be able to, to purchase them. But what was great was a few years ago, John Case at Case Antiques 
was able to get in touch with Bradley Burns, who was a former Adams studio assistant. And Burns was able to basically answer my question. He said he had the opportunity to discuss photography in the Smokies with Adams over a glass of two or Jack Daniels. He photographed there as part of a National Park series project. And basically he confessed that he found the old mountains a challenge to work with primarily because of the lack of this clear, crisp light that he was used to in the Sierra Nevadas, the heavily forested areas. So it's basically confirming what my suspicion was. However, he also talks about how, unlike other photographers who are using small, uh, easily portable equipment, he was lugging around this bulky eight by 10 camera because he was aiming to produce mural sized prints. So thanks to Bradley Burns, we finally had our answer as to why Ansel Adams really had such a difficult time. And, and we really cherish this one photograph we have. We hope we'll be able to track down and acquire the others. Um, in terms of city views, we wanted to certainly showcase the talents of Charles Griffin Farr. Farr wasn't born in East Tennessee, but he spent much of his youth and early adulthood in Knoxville and came to be known as a magic realist painter. On the right is a late work after he settled in San Francisco and really became known out there, not only as a painter, but as a teacher. And this particular painting, The Cocktail Hour, showcases his style, these uniform planes of color, this feeling of almost like a vacuum sealed reality where everything appears perfect and still and tranquil. And we were really lucky to come across a Knoxville a collector whose son had purchased this particular painting, Street in Knoxville from 1947. And it's a great, fairly early example of Farr's mature style. What I find striking is that it stylistically really doesn't differ much from this painting done in California many decades later. But this shows us a view of Knoxville that is remembered. And the reason why we know that this is not an actual situation where Farr is painting what he sees uh, is because of some research that Jack Neely did. If you look in the distance, let's see. Oh, I thought I had a slide of this. I think I deal with this later. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. I'm gonna go with Buford and Joseph Delaney first. Buford and Joseph Delaney are anchors of higher ground, and they've been anchors of Knoxville's art legacy. They were born into a remarkable family uh, whose home at 815 East Vine no longer stands, uh, but there fortunately is an historical marker near the spot. But this is the Delaney family, oh, circa 1908, 1910. And you can see Buford on the right and Joseph on the left sitting on the bench. One of the things that the KMA tried to do, we had always owned great examples of Joe's art. Joe donated two great paintings to us. We owned nothing of Buford's until fairly recently. And the key avenue through which this opportunity to anchor Buford's legacy here in Knoxville came by way of the KMA's partnership with the estate of Buford Delaney. The estate was willing to lend paintings to the KMA. And we in turn were able to provide them with museum quality climate controlled space to house the estate until it could be settled. One of the, the most important things that happened for higher ground was the 2018 culminating acquisition from the Delaney estate of these nine paintings by Knoxville's greatest painter, a fabulous modernist artist that America is duly proud of. And we bought these at the right time because the amount we paid for this group of nine, uh, basically some of his individual works now go for that amount. And with this acquisition, it put us in a position of doing something equally important. And that is making an original contribution to Buford Delaney's art history, to his story. 
uh, helping the art world reconsider his studio practice in an expanded and enriched light. And so what we decided to do was put together a show that focused the lens on Buford Delaney's studio practice through his association with James Baldwin. And it was a show that opened last year and really was a catalyst for lots of exciting things that happened in Knoxville. This world-class Delaney Baldwin symposium that the University of Tennessee organized and put on was basically done in response to the fact that we had this show here. Uh, we, again, here's the historical marker we talked about near the Delaney's original family home. On one side, there's a, a message about Buford. On the other side is a message about Joe. And so we're really excited that we finally got this done. And then the Beck Center in East Knoxville, right next door to the Beck Center is one of the Delaney's homes and it was really in sad shape. But because of this, this resurgence of, of interest in the Delaney family, uh, funds were raised and it's now slated as a Delaney Museum at Beck, which is a great outcome. Um, one of the things I'm excited about is that right now, if you're in Asheville, North Carolina, and you visit the Asheville Art Museum, you will see the KMA's Buford Delaney collection uh, installed there. And it's a show that's entitled Buford Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom. And it again, deals with uh, Buford's studio practice through the lens of James Baldwin's exceptional eyewitness account. And the estate was willing to lend some archival materials, which you see in the display case in the foreground of this image. So one of the things that led to all of this resurgence of, of Buford Delaney in Knoxville and to our uh, ability to put together the 2020 exhibition was our 2017 purchase of this pastel. Uh, it's a portrait of, Buford Del of, of James Baldwin by Buford Delaney from 1944 when Baldwin is still fairly young. And once we acquired this pastel and we were wondering back in 2017, what are we gonna do as a, a theme for our Buford Delaney exhibition? I looked at this pastel and that just gave me the answer. We have to make this about their relationship and the way in which Delaney's art and life example uh, inspired Baldwin, but at the same time, Baldwin's words have given us these great insights into what was happening in Delaney's world. Uh, Baldwin considered himself unattractive Delaney felt as if he was beautiful and found a way to take Baldwin's distinctive features and present them in this uh, uh, saintly light where he's got an aura, his face is filled with this iridescent color and it's a work that I think is really inspired. But I think it's interesting when you look back at one of the first stories that Baldwin tells of Delaney and his experiences with Delaney, I think it maybe contains clues as to why Delaney chose to use the particular palette he did. And Baldwin writes about how he and Delaney, who met in Greenwich Village at Delaney's studio back around 1940, they liked to walk the streets of Greenwich Village. And there was one time where I guess it had been raining and they get to an intersection and Delaney says, look, and Baldwin is mystified, what are you talking about? And Delaney says, look again. And it's then that Baldwin discovers at his feet, this oily puddle in which is a reflection of the city. And it becomes this revelation. And Baldwin says, because of this lesson, he taught me to see and to trust what I saw. And so it's this lesson, it's this oily puddle, it's this uh, notion of Delaney as someone tuned into uh, imagery in his environment in a way that other people weren't, that I think helps explain what we're looking at here and why this particular pastel has this iridescence to it. Um, it this pastel was done all of a year or two after this experience that Baldwin had. And if you look at a portrait of Delaney's mother, Delia Delaney from 1933, you can see how 
Stylistically, in terms of color, it's a huge departure for Delaney. One of the other things I found interesting was after we acquired this and we got it here from New York, I noticed in the lower right corner an inscription in charcoal to John Arvonio from Buford Delaney, 1944. And I immediately began trying to track down who is this John Arvonio. It turns out that Arvonio was a photographer who had actually taken some studio photographs for Delaney that were used in Henry Miller's 1945 chapbook on Delaney. But he was also an experimental filmmaker who specialized in short films. And his most famous is this 10 minute piece called Abstract in Concrete from 1952. Even though it didn't come out until 1952, the story goes that he was working on it as early as the mid 1940s. And basically this piece is all about the streets of New York City, uh, usually with nighttime, these reflections of uh, neon in, in puddles. And it brings to mind right away this story that Baldwin relates to wandering the streets with Delaney. And so you have to wonder, is Arvonio's film a response to this puddle story? Because Arvonio also knew Baldwin. And so there's a good chance the three of them were in conversation about this experience. Now in our 2020 exhibition, we were able to borrow from the Minneapolis Institute of Art this untitled Delaney painting from 1947 that is, I think, a really important and extraordinary painting because in the mid 1940s, Delaney was best known for these hard edged, abstracted images of the urban environment in New York City. And then suddenly we see this painting that is, uh, it's nebulous and it's swirling and it's liquid. And it's got these uh, strange bits of imagery, a bird, a star, an eye swirling around. And when you look at stills of Arvonio's film and you look at this painting by Delaney, you're thinking, well, there had to be a conversation here. And, and did this story and this, this puddle imagery inspire Delaney's later interest in pursuing uh, atmospheric abstraction, as we'll see later. Now, looking at Joseph Delaney, whose great paintings we've been able to always show because of his generosity with us, uh, we weren't able to acquire this painting until fairly recently. It popped up in a private collection in New York City. And what was funny was, at the time, I guess the actual title of the painting wasn't known and the New Yorkers assumed that this was a New York City scene. Well, the, the actual title was unearthed by the seller. They brought it to our attention. We were able to reach out to some benefactors. We were able to raise the money and we purchased this 1940 canvas by Joseph Delaney of Vine and Central, Knoxville, Tennessee. As Jack will tell you, Vine and Central was this exciting uh, cutting edge intersection where white and black Knoxville came together. It was a happening place. And for a young man like Joe Delaney who was interested in where the action was, it was just down the street from his family's home. And so we're really thrilled to have this painting here. One of the things that has been fun is for Jack and, and me, we talked about these two artists. They knew each other well. Uh, to have these two paintings in higher ground, these are both uh, images of urban Knoxville that are captured through the lens of memory. Uh, again, both of these scenes are painted years after the fact. And what's also exciting to see is stylistically how different they are, how Buford is, I'm sorry, Joseph is using this spontaneous, loose uh, brushwork. And he's going back in with highlights and even using charcoal and other uh, media to give this sense of a, of a drawing almost. It looks like he just dashed it off right there. Whereas Charles Farr will smooth the contours and, and wipe away any evidence of the brush. 
and it feels as if the paint has always been there or that it was airbrushed into place. So technically the two of them couldn't be further apart. So it's great to have these two views in the same exhibition. And then one of the things that uh, helped Jack confirm the fact that the Joseph Delaney painting was none other than a Knoxville scene was this blurry sign in the upper left, it says HL Bloom Grain and Seed, which used to be located at Vine and Central. And then on the right, in the distance, you'll see a strange looking blue sign. It's shaped like a bell. It's a sign for bell laundry, which Jack went back into the white pages. And this painting is dated 1947. I want to say, Jack, didn't you find that bell went out of uh, commission in the late 20s, maybe? I, I think that's right, Stephen. It was it was uh, it was it was popular for several years, but it was definitely uh, had closed before the, the the date of this painting. And then the other thing is that we're we're not actually sure where this vantage point would have been. It could be that uh, again through the lens of memory, he combined several buildings or vantage points to construct this particular composition. Yeah. You know, that's artistic license at its best. Yeah, my, my, my theory was that it was on Fifth Avenue near Gay Street, where there were some churches that looked uh, very much like the one in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the painting. What's frustrating is we actually had Charles Farr here at the KMA in 1997 for a one-person show, and he died shortly after that. And if we had known, we could have asked him about it. Yeah. Next is a chapter of the exhibition that uh, deals with modernism. Um, basically. Knoxville, its art scene became rather conservative with Farr and the Delaney brothers leaving town and basically having their prime careers in other locations. But by the mid 1950s, thanks to the arrival at UT of C. Kermit Ewing, called Buck Ewing, who established the art department at the university, he was troubled by what he saw and wanted to do something to revitalize Knoxville's visual arts scene. And so what he did was he gathered around him a group of younger, in some cases more talented artists to form a, a group that could organize shows and basically stir the drink in Knoxville. And what you see in front of you are some rare photographs that I found in an archive in North Carolina that shows the Knoxville Seven at one of their openings. And it gives you a sense of the flavor. They had all this uh, theatrical bent to many of their openings, thanks to Buck Ewing. And Buck appears in the middle row in the far left in a top hat or in a bowler hat. He was uh, a real showman and loved to come up with uh, basically a, a gimmick to get people to show up. And I've heard stories and in some cases, the people who were around when the Knoxville Seven were active often talk more about the party they went to than about the art on the walls. But nevertheless, Ewing was successful in energizing Knoxville's art scene. And what the Knoxville Seven did that I really admire is they connected with and understood larger contemporary art movements of their day, such as abstract expressionism and pop art. So they, they were conversant in what those styles were all about. However, in many cases, what they did that I think was, was so exciting is they catered these styles and brought them to the classroom at UT or to their openings, but they, in many cases, depicted local subject matter. And so because of that, uh, again, it just creates this, this level of relevance that um, I think lended so much energy to our local scene. There was a, a, a female member of the Knoxville Seven, and I think she, yeah, she's the only living member because Philip Nichols died recently, Joanna Higgs Ross. She's still working away in her studio in Nashville. And this is one of her paintings that we were fortunate to be gifted by one of her key benefactors. It's called Trees and Sky. 
and she's using the slashing brushwork of de Kooning or Joan Mitchell. But what she's done is she was given a ride, her first ever ride through Cade's Cove by her future husband. And when she got back to the studio, she was so energized by this experience of driving through Cade's Cove that she went to the studio and created this triptych that contains snippets of, of imagery and color based on her recollection of that experience. And so it's exciting to have this particular painting in our collection, but again, it's abstract expressionist brushwork with a local subject. And then this great painting by Carl Sublett that I admired for years called Composition Pop Goes My Easel. Carl was one of the core members of the Knoxville Seven and a, a humble, multi-talented painter who could paint in almost any style. He's probably best known for his Andrew Wyeth-like watercolors, but he, more than any of the other Knoxville Seven artists, experimented with pop art, which really isn't surprising because he worked for a commercial design firm. And so knowing that pop art is pulling from uh, the world of graphic design and uh, consumer culture, that was the perfect environment to inspire him to dabble with pop art. And this painting is a great example. And it's called Pop Goes My Easel. But the bold lettering that you see says, look, Knoxville, all America city. And we're going to dive into a little bit more about uh, what this is all about. So in 1963, Knoxville is celebrated by Look Magazine as one of its all America cities and their actual criteria that a city has to meet in order to become uh, elected into this renowned circle of cities. Uh, it has to be open to new business. It has to be inclusive. It has to meet all these different things. And Knoxville is given this award, but what's so funny is right around this time that they're being awarded, there are sit-ins, there are arrests being made because Knoxville is still largely segregated. And so this, this diverse group of protesters were on Gay Street, they were marching all over town, protesting the fact that Knoxville was still segregated, there had been arrests made, and yet they're being awarded this, this All-America City designation. And so Sublet and the Knoxville Seven are preparing for a major show of their art at McClung Museum. And so what they end up doing is catering this show and many of the works in this show to this travesty as they saw it. And so it's a great example of the Knoxville Seven showing not just an awareness of the larger art world, but the social consciousness that I don't think they're often credited for. Here we see a close up of some of this imagery. We've got these silhouetted uh, dark and light heads, uh, the Look Magazine uh, logo. And I tracked down the cover that I think may have served as Sublet's inspiration. It's this cover from May 22nd that shows Lenin, this uh, bold head with these burgundy blacks and whites. Uh, and I think that that was the cover that may have sparked some of Sublet's composition. And if you look here on the left is a bit of, of memorabilia. This was the, the uh, card that they printed as like the brochure for their exhibition. And it's this, this flag, seven Knoxville artists of America, and on the right, you see a clipping showing Walter Stevens, one of the members of the Knoxville Seven. And he's created this spur of the moment sculpture in the gallery. And it, he calls it the cultural seat of the South. And again, he's again, using all kinds of sarcasm in this spontaneous piece that he created for the show. But you can also see how Sublet is looking at the work of Jasper Johns, the renowned pop artist, again, bringing uh, major art movements of the day to what they were doing here in Knoxville. Even the program, you can look at some of Jasper John's flag paintings as a prototype for this particular design. Uh, I also wanted to mention the Marion Greenwood 
mural. This is a mural that has a long and distinguished history in Knoxville. Uh, I went to University of Tennessee for a number of years and never even knew it existed. Uh, but Buck Ewing had a hand in, in making this happen. He identified Marion Greenwood as a desirable artist from New York to come down to East Tennessee. And she was being commissioned by Ewing and the university to paint a roughly 30 foot long mural for the student center. And after a lot of discussion, she landed on the theme of music for her mural, which was a great choice. And so the, the painting more or less reads as a map of Tennessee musically going from the Beale Street blues of Memphis on the far left to the country music of Nashville to the sacred mountain music on the right of East Tennessee. I wanted to show you this uh, shot of us installing this piece in higher ground at the Knoxville Museum of Art. So long story short, uh, the painting was on view by 1955 in the student center. It remained a fixture there for roughly 10 years. But by the time of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War, there were protests by members of the student body about the imagery in the mural. It had been uh, defaced and damaged during some Vietnam War protests. And so basically the university decided they were going to cover the mural behind a wall they didn't want to have to deal with the controversy. And so for years, it was basically off limits. In 2006, there was this resurgence of interest in bringing the mural back onto view and having some discussions about it. And not long after those discussions happened, the decision was made, the university was going to demolish the student center. And so I was contacted about, well, do you know a conservator, Stephen, who might be able to help us get this painting off the wall so that we can move it to a new location? So we went back and forth, we had discussions. In the meantime, the painting was treated by a conservator. It was backed with this fabric that extended maybe three inches all the way around the entire painting. And the painting was rolled onto this drum where it could be stored and it would be rotated periodically so that it would never crease. So when we worked out a deal with the university to bring it into higher ground, have it on loan for five years at a time, we had to build a stage in higher ground. We had to take this rolled up painting and basically have a team of people unroll it, press it against the wall. And then we had this high powered staple gun that drove staples through this conservation cloth that was attached with archival adhesive to the back of the painting so that we were stapling into only conservation material, not the actual painting. And then to hide it all is a black frame that covered that stapled fabric. Now, one of the things that had to happen before we secured this loan was, we had to bring it before our board of trustees. And it turns out that the board was so excited about this loan, except for one individual. There was one person on our board who had a real problem with it. And so we ended up deciding to sit down with her and to talk through what her problem was with us borrowing and showing this mural. Well, it turns out that she was one of the African-American students at UT at the time who had protested the depiction of African-Americans in this mural. And so her main complaint was that there were no other images of people of color on UT campus except for this. And if there had been others, maybe this wouldn't have been so objectionable. And she said the other problem was that whenever this mural had been shown after the 2006 uh, bringing it back on view, the university had never told the story of why it had been controversial. So what we decided to do was to involve her in some new language that addressed 
the controversy and what had sparked it. And so after going back and forth, she became really excited about the idea of being able to present the mural at the KMA with this expanded interpretive narrative. And what was fun for me was a few weeks after this painting was installed, uh, I came up to the Higher Ground Gallery and I saw her there with one of her friends and she was showing it off to them. So that was a great outcome. Um, I thought I would kind of come on the home stretch by mentioning a couple of recent acquisitions and then also sharing with you a wish list of some pieces I hope we can acquire for higher ground. But first to recent acquisitions. Uh, just recently, we were able to find at a commercial gallery an available East Tennessee scene by none other than Thomas Hart Benton, one of the great regionalist artists of the mid 20th century. We knew that he had been in East Tennessee, but these Tennessee images of his were so rare. We found one that was bought up before we had a chance to go after it. We found this one and were able to put it on reserve and raise the money to acquire it through our collectors group. It's a, a print that is a mirror image of an oil painting in the St. Louis Art Museum, which you see on the right, along with a quote that is uh, connected to this particular composition. Uh, talking about Benton does, talking about the hill country of Tennessee in 1928. He was fascinated by the, the technique being used to harvest and cradle the wheat, the, the tools and, and the techniques, and was interested in trying to preserve those. So we're so thrilled to have this lithograph as part of our collection. And then for decades, I had been enamored with the photographs of Charles E. Crouch, not to be confused with his uncle, Charles Christian Crouch, famous as a Smokies watercolor painter. Uh, Charles E. Crouch is the one that has that uh, unique sculpture of his downtown at Crouch Park, uh, where he's sitting on top of the world. That is Charles E. Crouch, who was a, an extremely talented photographer, among other things. And he was commissioned by TVA in the 1930s and 40s and even into the 50s to document uh, many of their new construction projects that were aimed at basically bringing energy and a new quality of life to the valley. And he's best known for these slick precisionist images of the turbines and the dams that were TVA's legacy, but he is also known, but much less so for images of uh, some of the devastation caused by the construction, some of the erosion, but also some of the workers who, who were responsible for getting these massive structures up off the ground. And for the first time in roughly 25 years, I was able to track down this available lifetime print by Charles E. Crouch of TVA workers who were there in Red Bank, Tennessee, not too far from Chattanooga from 1935. And we were the successful bidder at auction. We were able to acquire this print and we're gonna have it matted and framed and incorporated into higher ground in the near future. But I'm so glad to finally have a print of Charles E. Crouch's in the collection. Now, in terms of uh, our wish list, I'm going to, there are tons of things we'd love to have, paintings, sculptures, and all that, but I'm going to focus on photography because it seems to be where there's just so much great opportunity. Um, here are a couple of uh, great photographs that we've already acquired. They're already part of this higher ground photography collection. Henri Cartier-Bresson's photograph taken close to Market Square Mall around 1947 of this elegantly clad woman with a patch over her eye and she's sitting in this truck with a coupe on the hood. It's one of those classic moments that Cartier-Bresant had the ability to capture. He's best known for being able to seize the moment and really cut through to human behavior at its most intriguing. On the right is one of a portfolio of black and white prints by renowned 
photojournalist Danny Lyon. And it was done when he was coming through Knoxville on his way to Texas. And he wanted to uh, basically explore the legacy of James Agee. He adored Agee and Walker Evans. And when he gets to Fort Sanders and looks for Agee's home, of course, it's been demolished and he finds James Agee apartments. So he thinks he's going to skip town, but instead bumps into one subject after another. Next thing you know, he stayed here for a couple of weeks and produced some amazing photos, such as the one you see on the right. This was actually just written up by The Guardian not too long ago. Um, Lewis Hine is someone that I really admire. He came through Knoxville, actually through much of the South in 1910, uh, studying child labor and spent time in Knoxville uh, documenting not only uh, child workers in the mines, but also in the textile mills, really some amazing photographs. And I'm waiting for some of these to surface so that we can acquire them. Um, also, George Masa, a Japanese-born photographer who specialized in scenes of the Smokies on the Western North Carolina side, but he did come to Tennessee. And this great image of chimney tops is definitely on my wish list. He died, unfortunately, right before the park was established in 1934. Uh, and here, for instance, on the right is a watercolor by Charles C. Crouch that's in our collection. On the left is a photograph of chimney tops by Jim Thompson that's in our collection. So this George Massa chimney tops would be just a really great addition for all sorts of reasons. And then Anne-Marie Schwarzbach, a Swiss writer and photographer uh, came through Knoxville in 1937. Jack's written some outstanding articles celebrating her unique gifts and personality. And uh, you know some great quotes she left behind about Knoxville, one of which appears on the screen about its streets and uh, how you could basically go from one corner to the other and experience something completely unlike what she just passed. But many of her prints are just stunning compositions that I think are, are attractive for aesthetic reasons at the same time. Some of them might make you wince if you're a Knoxvillian looking at the state of things in the 1930s. What's also fun is to think that Schwarzenbach was very involved and interested in what TVA was doing. And to be able to acquire a group of Charles E. Crouch's photographs and some of her photographs and have them together, I think would be a great way to represent the 1930s in photography when it comes to Knoxville. Uh, of course, I wanted to mention Ansel Adams. Uh, these two prints we'd love to acquire, hoping that they surface at some point, but I feel like ours on the left is the stellar example out of the three. It's almost like this uh, Gothic cathedral of uh, a stand of poplar trees. And even though it's black and white, the gradations of tone almost give the suggestion of the fall colors that we can't quite see. However, we can see them in this print by Elliot Porter, who was the other great American landscape photographer of the 20th century. While Adams specialized in black and white, Porter was renowned for his, uh, his color work. And here we see a shot that he takes roughly 20 years after Adams' visit um, along Newfound Gap Road of poplars. So I'd love to be able to have a print of Elliot Porter's Poplars and Hillside right next to our Ansel Adams print. And then I wanted to finish with this. Uh, this is completely off the record. This is our plan for in a reinstalled higher ground that we're aiming to unveil in 2023 along with a book length catalog. And what we're gonna do is on the third floor of the museum, we're going to shift higher ground across the way to the largest gallery where our contemporary collection is, and then move our contemporary collection where higher ground is. That'll allow us to expand higher ground's footprint, devote more space as you'll see to our Delaney collection, which appears in the yellow portion of the gallery. Um, and also to our grand ambitions portion 
because we've acquired so much great work by Catherine Wiley. So this expanded footprint will help us clarify these important chapters in this art history, uh, give the key paintings a place to shine and be shown in sufficient quantity. Right now, a lot of our great paintings are in storage because there's just not enough room for everything. It's still gonna be somewhat of a crunch, but this gives us a much better chance to tell this broadened story. And we've already gotten some high level grant funds to support this project. Um, my hope is that we can get some great stories to be part of the catalog. So stay tuned. Uh, that's my rambling 100 mile per hour journey through higher ground and some of the key works. So thank you for your time and attention. And I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. That was fascinating. I, uh, I, I I saw stuff that I've never seen before, and and heard some things I've never seen before, heard before too. That, that was that was was really interesting. Hey, Stephen, we have a question in the chat bar from Regis Basori. Uh, where would the the Greenwood mural go, or would that go back to UT? That is a great question. Uh, we have decided that we like to try. Uh, putting it in the lobby outside of the gallery. Um, that's going to require some special scaffolding and some very brave individuals. But that way, as you're entering the higher ground entrance to your right, you would see the mural. I think it would be pretty stunning there. And we've measured the wall. We think it would fit and look really good. It would also be a measure of protection as well. So that's the current thinking, stay tuned. Stephen, that was great. Uh, one question, what's the significance of the higher ground uh, uh, naming of your gallery? So that's a great question. Um, that's a whole nother presentation, but long story short, our feeling about higher ground was that it referenced the longstanding interest of Catherine Wiley, Lloyd Branson, uh, members of the Nicholson Art League, which I didn't get a chance to get into, but the early arts community in Knoxville and their belief that by cultivating a vibrant and vital visual arts scene, that they would be able to elevate the entire community, uh, spark new development and to bring new technology and, and new settlements to town. They, they believed that the arts were able to, to create this sense of reaching higher ground as a, a, an aspiring Southern city. Um, but what, what I like about it, as we built our Delaney collection is, what does higher ground mean to Joseph and Buford Delaney? Uh, in fact, was leaving East Tennessee and heading for New York, uh, Chicago, Paris, a way of reaching higher ground. So through the, the generations and looking at different artists' stories, I think the concept higher ground uh, is just a fertile one. It, it gives us such an opportunity to explore what that particular concept meant. You know, for the Knoxville Seven, it was getting Knoxville out of this regionalist rut and getting it connected to broader conversations that were happening globally about art and its ability to define the information age, the, the Cold War age, whatever you want to call it. I, I'm impressed that you had that Thomas Hart Benton. I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't had a good look at that yet. And, and, that, and that connects, of course, Joseph Delaney, who was uh, inspired by and worked with a uh, study from Thomas Hart Benton in New York. Exactly. And also Marion Greenwood. I think you can compare them interestingly. Uh, Most as definitely. Well. Yeah, yeah. But if anybody wants to, I've, I've become fascinated with Charles Griffin Farr and his perspective. And everybody, I, I've just begun to scratch the surface of uh, what he did in Knoxville. We, in our book, uh, Knoxville Lives 2, I have a, a kind of a long story about Knoxville in the 20s and how he was one of the more interesting people. He and his mom, interestingly, his mom, and that's something to remember for Mother's Day. His mom ran uh, kind of an artsy coffee shop downtown, and uh, and and later on, he was working in the coffee shop at the uh, 
at the Melrose Art Center, so which was kind of a predecessor to the KMA, by kind of a step grandfather or something in a way. But um, but he was uh, kind of connected to this. He he lived in Paris and came back to Knoxville and and tried different things here. Uh, and I would just love to see some of his earliest work and and you know, what he was shocking people with here when he showed stuff at the at the Melrose. Uh, I understand that they didn't accept everything that he proposed to to show there. Um, so that uh, it's it was a really a more interesting period than I, I even knew about when I began looking into this, partly inspired by what made Charles Griffin Farr work. And it was surprisingly, he was connected to people like Charlie Barber and all these other people as well who were young, creative people, energetic, creative people who were going to the Smoky Mountains every weekend. And it was a brand, uh, this brand new you know place that no, most people had never been before. Uh, and they were kind of being inspired by that, even though you don't see it in his urban work. But um, but it's uh, he was he was uh, some of his hikes made it into the newspaper, in the newspaper in those days. So well, actually, uh, that that sparks a, another recent acquisition that I, I overlooked. After years of trying, we finally have acquired a great example of uh, Hugh Tyler's work. Tyler being so connected as uh, the the maker of these amazing. Uh, architectural arts and design you see in, in Hoskins Library uh, when you walk in before you get the reference room and they're just staggering things that he did locally uh, with, with painting and architecture. However, this is a Mediterranean scene that showcases his uh, talents for uh, painting impressionist paintings. But of course, most of us know Hugh Tyler as James Agee's uncle. And so there's this interesting connection between Danny Lyon and and James Agee and Hugh Tyler. And then uh, Hugh Tyler was Buford Delaney's first instructor based upon Buford's sketchbook that we came across. We have a sketchbook in our collection from the Delaney estate where in Buford's hand, he wrote, I received my first lesson in drawing and painting from Hugh Tyler under the tutelage of Lloyd Branson. Wow. So, um, I just love the fact that we've got this exciting network of, of connections with all these amazing, talented people. It's a matter of just acquiring all the right work needed to complete those those connections. And, and, and I was saying about Tyler's, uh, Tyler's kind of clifftop uh, piece of with a deer in it. Uh, I, I oh, yeah. can't remember what, uh, that that looks very much like a, like it could have been the same scene as Belle Isle, the, the camera and Cameron's piece. I, I don't know if that was literally lines view that he was doing or, or not do you know anything about you know, you know it's 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 actually uh, from mcclung museum's collection and the title that's associated with it it's it's a mediterranean identification oh, based yeah. on that yeah. Yeah. yeah now i'm not sure that that's uh, necessarily accurate ours is clearly a mediterranean scene and he did specialize in those but i guess yeah. there's a chance that could be knoxville yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at those deer in the in the Cameron picture and the and the kind of the declivity behind it that you I think you you, you sense in the Tyler piece too. But anyway, yeah. Hey, uh, Stephen, I got another question, and uh, this is on behalf of Bob Davis as well, who's just put something in the chat. But I'm I'm glad that you included Jim Thompson. He was someone I talked about on Zoom a few weeks ago, and also did a story in that book that Jack just pulled up, but. Obviously, when you have a Jim Thompson photograph, you like to show the, the comparison or contrast with, with George Mosser and also Ansel Adams. But also, but my question, I guess, is what would you be looking for in a Jim Thompson print if you were going to acquire more? Because he, obviously there's quite a few. He, he took a lot of photographs and probably still a lot exist. But from a, from a Knoxville Museum of Art point of view, what would you be looking for to acquire in, another one? I mean, I, I've got my own preferences when it comes to uh, Thompson's work. There are a handful that I've got on my wish list that I think are just as compositions showcasing his uh, artistic side at its best. There are times when I, I don't think his compositions are necessarily successful from an aesthetic standpoint, but they're very great at describing something uh, in terms of topography. Um, I felt as if when he was taking his photographs, he had a number of agendas or hats. And so it's my responsibility being a, an art museum curator to look for the examples of his work that A, represent that, 
that ability to capture the aesthetic moment when the light was just right, the angle was just right. But also we have to find examples of his silver prints that are in pristine condition. And so there've been some things of his I've seen where I thought that's an image I want, but the condition of that print, we, we can't go after that. We have to buy things that are in pristine condition. So, uh, so far, that means just one image. That's the only piece we have in our collections, the one I showed. And my hope is that other pristine prints of his best compositions will surface. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. This has been uh, this has been great. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. And 